room that they turned into a studio. All right, cool. We're live. And then, but yeah, there's several spaces, but for me, it's it's just kind of like, I don't know. We've got our own thing here. I've got it built out. I've paid money for it. I might as well use this for a couple of years and then, you know, in, in 2019, start looking for a space because theoretically, Patreon donations are going to be at a point after a, an election cycle that I'll have the ability to do that. Right. You know, so well, I mean, you might want to get like six months up or something in advance so that way you don't have to. Like, exactly about right. It. Yeah. Have a nest egg. Exactly right. So, all right, here we go. Welcome to We Are the. Whoa. Peeking again. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We bring you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves while putting people before political parties. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective with the goal of leaving you better informed. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and become a subscriber on Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. Without your financial support, independent media like this cannot exist. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you great bonus content. This week we dissected the uh, the article that's going around about the 10 things every intersectional feminist should ask her date on the first date. And Harry and I broke down that article point by point and explained why some of the things that, the, that were in that article were good and some – the majority of it were bad. <laughs> so you can hear that if you're a $5 a month subscriber on Patreon. Uh, great takedown of intersectional feminism. And then uh, this show is crowdsourced, so you can send us news with the hashtag WAL News or in our Facebook group or Discord channel. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. In fact, this whole episode is going to be sourced from our Facebook page where we ask you about Bitcoin. So please be warned that this show is raw, unedited, and authentic, so the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, in the show, again, we're going to talk about Bitcoins for uh, idiots, so I'm not using trademark stuff. Uh, my name is Chris Spangle, uh, and with me, returning, is uh, one, of, one of my nerd friends, uh, Jesse Riddle. Jesse, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, that's probably me that left their phone on. <laughs> the brought no. See, it's Jeff Vibbert. This little son He's of a bitch. He, He's Jeff, trolling you. I have to remove him from Dear Leader's Court because every single time I start a show, <laughs> he, calls, he calls me and FaceTimes me. Bravo, Jeff. Uh, so Riddle is back. Riddle is always uh, featured on the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast. I mean, you're Not always you're on there every about I've what, been there three times. Yeah, I mean, which is uh, you're you're very critical of that show, are you not? I'm critical of all these shows. Right. <laughs> You're an INTJ, aren't you? Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, which means asshole. I want you guys to do well, but I'm super critical as well. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my next guest it, here for the first time is Jeff Erdman. Jeff, how are you? I'm amazing. Uh, the only Jeff that will be heard on this broadcast tonight. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> He's now trolling me in the in the chat. So we we stream this live to Dear Leaders Court, which is a private Facebook group for our ten dollar a month Patreon subscribers. And it's really fun because it's a very small group. It's about eighty people who who chit chat. You get you get friendship as well as live streams of the show. Um, but and you can you can chat with us while the show is going on, and I can kind of see the comments, and you can interact a little bit. And uh, I made the mistake of putting my friend Jeff Vibbert of Barstool Heartland in there, and now he trolls me every single episode, so I apologize for that. Um, Jeff, you and I met 2010, I think, 2009, 2010, I would say. I believe so. It's back in the uh, Bob Barr days. Yeah. <laughs> You're a big Bob Barr fan, were you? Uh, beat the alternative, <laughs> right? And uh, I was too. I, right. felt, I mean, if you're if you're sitting there like looking uh, at the things, I didn't know Bob Barr from Adam, but when I right. looked at his record versus John McCain and Barack Obama, it was a no brainer for me. Right, right, yeah. For about ten minutes, I was on in the on Team Obama, and then I discovered libertarianism about about oh eight. Very you know. very similar paths, you and I. Yeah, and uh, been a libertarian ever since. Yeah, big L, little L. However you slice it. Yep. So you you uh, were thinking about starting a uh, a county party. You, you and your cohorts did not end up following through on that, but you and I have maintained a Facebook friendship over the years. Correct. And I was looking for a second 
cryptocurrency, let's say expert, but people who at least know anything about Bitcoin that they didn't learn in the last month. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of Bitcoin experts now. Oh, they're everywhere. Definitely. Right. But there's not a lot of people who knew the knowledge before two months ago. So, so I tried to find people who have been involved in Bitcoin and <clears throat> cryptocurrency for longer than two months. And uh, Jeff and Jesse fit the bill. And we're going to talk a little bit in this episode about cryptocurrency and how you can get involved, how you can get invest, invested, what are the pitfalls. We've solicited questions from our Facebook page. Um, but first, I want to take a, a chance to talk about two things in the news. First, this will be short and sweet. I wrote an article on WeAreLibertarians.com that has been pretty controversial for some reason on the We Are Libertarians Facebook page. And it is about the text messages that were released by uh, Fox News the other day from some of the Mueller team's in, uh, team investigators. Uh, Peter Strzok was somebody that we've talked about in the past, and they're pretty damning. And uh, I laid out the entire explanation of the Russia investigation, who these people are, and why this is a big deal. It matters in terms of will the media cover it after g being gung-ho about the Russia investigation? And uh, it appears not. Uh, CNN Today was not covering it at all. But I, I, wrote, I wrote out, I laid out the entire Russia investigation and explained kind of the, some of the characters on the Mueller team and what's been going on and why. From the beginning, this has been a very biased investigation, and as we've said over the program, I've said a few times that nothing really, there's really no, there's maybe a little smoke, but there's no fire that anybody can point to, and uh, it it kind of turns out that it was the it was the FBI and the DOJ who really started all this, so the, these text messages finally pinpointed where the Russia uh, meme came from, so... Be sure to check that out at wheelerlibertarians.com. And then today, net neutrality was net neutrality was repealed. Uh, Jesse, you you've you've asked to come on and talk about net neutrality, so I do want to address it. But net neutrality wasn't exactly repealed. We're not going to go too in depth because we've done several different shows on this that you can go back and listen to if you want more in depth. But just to touch on what happened today, what exactly happened today? I all I know is that they voted against like bring it out yeah. of like brought it down. I don't know what that means though. So they repealed the Obama move from 2015. So the internet basically reset to 2015. That dark and gloomy period Terrible. was it. So is it literally like to starting that time? Like yes. everything? Okay, I, that's what I didn't understand. Right. I knew what it was doing. I just didn't know when it took effect. Yeah. So they they basically undid <clears throat> what had been done. And I could be I could be wrong because it's it's a very uh, long, complicated thing that it. But I mean, are are you for or against net neutrality? I am for free markets. Okay, so I mean, like, that. yeah. So uh, I talked about this on Boss Hog as well, but um, you know, I don't think that th there's a huge libertarian argument being made, which is baffling, that we need the government to uh, protect the internet and. Uh, if you're anything like me, uh, the internet to me is property. You know, all of the infrastructure is owned by companies. And if they don't want to serve you, they have every right to do that. You may not like that. I may not like that, but they could do it. Um, so that was my stance. Uh, you know, the, the, it comes back down to the Jews should never make a cake for Nazi. You know, if I don't want child porn predators sending like predator content across the internet that the, that we know they're doing, but maybe like, the Justice Departments haven't actually been doing anything. They have every right to stop feeding those people. Um, and they can, you know, based on contract. So, sure. But, yeah, it's just um, – so in a long-winded answer, I was for repealing it. Um, and I don't feel like it's going to be that big of a deal because, again, 2014, 2015 was not long ago. Everything kind of worked. And any any kerfuffles that happened amongst major players, uh, Verizon, uh, not Verizon, sorry, Comcast and uh, Netflix, you know, they dealt with that themselves and got content fixed. So yeah, I mean, if you if you listen to any interview with Ajit Pai, he doesn't sound like a devil. He sounds right. like a very intelligent, you know, freedom loving person. I mean, right. I, I don't. It's like Armageddon to people on the internet today, and it's just so overblown and so hyperbolic. And yeah. and I just you know trying to 
trying to reason with people when they're hysterical over something that is so not needed. I it, mean, it's just you don't need the hysteria. I was following you, the Twitter hashtags and just like mind blown by like how like the comparisons that are being made. Right. I was just like, this is way overblown, guys. Well, that's because it's not rooted in fact or reality or <laughs> ideology. It's rooted in fashion. Right. It, it is basically people like wanting to look cool to their friends. Yep. And so they start virtue signaling and then they one up each other to the point that it's like we're now at the verbal equivalent on net neutrality of like fishnet <laughs> jeans yeah. on the runway like that you'd never wear in reality. Yeah. But uh, to fashionistas, it looks cool and it's cutting edge. Yeah, like it just it, you really and, and I see this on our big Facebook page, the We Are Libertarians Facebook page all the time. Like people don't read the article. They just they don't ever deal with what. Uh, what, like, I post, right? They just deal with whatever reactionary dumb thing comes out of their mouth, like yep. you know. And so it's just really disheartening. And net neutrality is just like ground zero of dumb reactionary stuff. Like, I don't know how much you followed it, Jeff. Like, are you into net neutrality? Is this like a trigger for you? It's not really a trigger. I followed enough to sort of know what's going on. I, I, you know, gut reaction. Oh, it's terrible, right? Right. But then once you start reading into it, yeah, what? I I was uh, against this decision in Ajit Pai until I listened to, like, four interviews, long-form interviews with, like, Reason and Matt Lewis and the, and some other places. And I was just like, this guy's not crazy. Like, right. <laughs> he's actually – he actually sounds pretty libertarian if you, right. you really get into it. It's a very libertarian issue. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, you know – the first, it's everyone's treating it like a first amendment attack mm -hmm. i'm like well you can say whatever you want you just we you don't have the right to get it distributed ma in mass mm -hmm. right so the other part of it is that the consumers have spoken and f to change the pricing structure to something where you'd pay 14.99 for just netflix and creating these tunnels right it 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 just would never happen now because it would be such a PR nightmare for these companies. That's why they're paying Facebook and Twitter to advertise mm -hmm. these companies right. that are against them. Facebook is against Comcast on this issue, and Comcast is paying them money to blast into my Facebook feed that they're never going to do what Facebook is saying they're going to do. You know, nor would Netflix ever enter into an agreement based on what Netflix, Twitter, Facebook, Google, all these companies said today. None of them would enter into an exclusive deal with these com with the, the ISPs. So we're really arguing, like hyperbole. Hyperbole. We're we're arguing straw man. I mean, we're yeah. not, we're not actually having conversations based on what ISPs will actually do now. And it goes back to 2005 when Vonage basically curried favor with a, 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 a company on their phone service, and then that's what lit the, the match here in America for, for, the, um, for the net neutrality argument. And then it ended up with you know Ted Stevens of Alaska saying that it's like a big truck. It's, the internet is not, it's yeah. not a series of tubes. It's, yeah, yeah, there's it, no tubes. There's no <laughs> tubes. And so, so we're just not at a point where they're realistically going to do what, what advocates against Ajit Pai are saying they're going to do at this point. They could 25 years down the road, but at this point they're not going to. So, yeah. Um, all right. So enough about net neutrality, but I just wanted to touch on it. And if you want to, if you want to really dive into it more, uh, because I was, I was somebody that was like, I don't know anything about net neutrality. And then I really started digging in, digging in, digging in, having people on over the last couple months. And uh, this is where I ended up. And you can hear my, uh, exegesis on it. So, on to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So, let's first ask, gentlemen, what are your qualifications? What qualifies you, Jesse Riddle? Well, this is one of the questions to talk about <laughs> cryptocurrency. You're not supposed. To... Listen, Jesse. Let me explain <laughs> something to you. I'm an ENFJ. Okay, I'm a natural born showman, and uh, you are an INTJ. So, you like facts. I was smoothly transitioning to the questions without them knowing that I'm a dummy who's reading off of a script. <laughs> I appreciate you pointing out the very obvious point. But we told them that we pulled them from Facebook. Ah, I know. It's, uh, but, we smoke and mirrors, but we memorized smoke and them. Right. This is I apologize. Show, it's this all is, been internalized. This, this is, is why I'm not allowed on. This is show business. Okay? <laughs> Do you not realize that? Show business. In the middle of my kitchen 
<laughs> with, with fake foam on the walls. <laughs> so if you, wa- if you watch this on YouTube, because we put the video of every uh, show up on YouTube, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, I, I don't think you can tell that this is my, my living room. No, basically. you can't. Mm. Yeah. I was curious because I've been here before, mm-hmm. before this was a, a thing. Right. And I was like, I wonder if, like, I know it was, like, here, but I was like, I didn't understand the camera. The same thing with Boss Hog. When I saw it and then I actually got in the room, I was right. like, this is not what I imagined. Yeah. This is much nicer, isn't it? Yeah. There's, there's cats. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Mittens is over there in her box. She's got an Amazon box that she chills in. <laughs> I fit. I sit. Mitt- Mittens is a huge fan of the uh, Amazon Washington Post Jeff Bezos uh, <laughs> company because she gets free boxes to sit in all the time. So, uh, but yeah, uh, you you are an expert on crypto. How, what's your experience with cryptocurrency, and how long have you kind of been involved in it? Um, I've been purchasing it probably for the last two to two and a half years. Um, I've attended a meetup but they were in, in castleton here in indianapolis mm-hmm. um so it's hard to actually get up there um and then uh you know i've i've talked a lot of people into getting into it uh over the course of the last probably year or so um a mutual friend robert white he and i we watch like the walking dead on sundays and i'm always trying to like tell him hey man you should jump on the boat and he never does so he's finally jumped in you know deep deeper than i've jumped so really yeah okay yeah i got in on coinbase uh two weeks ago i put 150 in uh i put 50 in at nine thousand on bitcoin and 100 on 14 basically that's all your gains and then uh wrote it up until yesterday and i had taken out of bitcoin put it into litecoin wrote it up to when it looked like it was cresting yesterday took everything out doubled my money Basically went from 150 to 300 when I when I checked out of the system because I want to use that cash for Christmas presents at this point. Right. So, um, I mean, I'm pretty qualified to talk about the subject now. Yeah, Litecoin's falling too, so you made a good choice. Yeah, well, that's kind of uh, I was sitting at lunch watching CNN, CNBC, and like they're saying short Bitcoin, short Bitcoin, and my watch flashes and it's a Bitcoin app and it says, you know, Bitcoin's falling, and then another app came through and was like, you know what? I could use that money for Christmas presents, and then if it falls, I can get back in and then, you know, ride the long investment. But um, so, so yes, I'm uh, basically like, uh, I'm kind of like the, the, uh, what's that old, Warren Buffett of Bitcoin at this point. All right. So then you would have hold or hodl. 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 Yes. Which I had to Google this week. Yeah. I I had to answer that one. All right. Non existent questions. All right. So you've been in for a couple of years. Yep. So and paying attention even longer. It's just when you when you're first told this, and I I feel like this is where everyone is. Uh, you know, you try to be like it's and everyone's like it's like PayPal. You're like that's right. what you think, and you're like, and then when you get into it, you're like, this is nothing like PayPal. Yeah. So my yeah. boss today was asking about it because his son has made quadruple what he put in just a few weeks ago, and it's a pretty significant amount, and. uh like had the app worked right, he would have made one hundred and seventy thousand oh, dollars. Nice. Like, <laughs> but uh, still did okay. And so, you know, my boss, who is not technologically knowledgeable, is asking me about Bitcoin. And this is a person who uh, six months ago would have gone, "That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life." You know, I mean. And so he's like, "Can you explain to me how to buy this Ripple coin?" And I'm like, <laughs> "What? I'm like, what universe am I in?" So, so I was funny. like, "Honestly, I don't know. Uh, maybe call me tomorrow because I'm going to talk to some dudes tonight that might help me." But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of hit that point where now it, everybody wants to get in. I'll say it. It reminds me of like we've all been into libertarianism for a while and. You couldn't walk around the streets and hear it being thrown around, and now you hear it being thrown around. You're like, okay, this thing's catching on. Yeah. And now, like, Bitcoin has shot past libertarianism as far right. as, like, the frequency of it being used. Yeah. Um, and it's actually being used on Bloomberg all the time. I actually found out about Ripple on Bloomberg, like, hmm. probably 10 months ago. Interesting. Um, yeah, so. Because J.P. Morgan Chase is now backing it, right? Or uh, involved? Well, the whole thing is Ripple – not to dive into that, but like, yeah, like it's trying to work with banks to help move funds across, I guess, countries or something. So, um, but yeah, it was just, uh, I made a tweet. I remember tweeting like, Hey, it's really cool to see, uh, like cryptocurrency guys on Bloomberg, you know, being talked to in a serious manner and actually being in like the main stage, whether or not I don't necessarily care about ripple, but, um, 
it was cool to see that that was actually happening. Yeah, and just for the sake of posterity, so if you're listening to this like two years in the future, Bitcoin uh, right now is at uh, 16,800. Ethereum is at 682. Ripples at uh, 0.7880, so uh, 78 cents. Litecoin, 281 dash 917. It was 700 two weeks ago when I talked to Roger Ripple Paxton. was 25 cents, I think, this morning. Okay. And then, <laughs> wow. Um, it might have been yesterday. But... Some of the other NXT, 69 cents. Yeah. Neo has actually jumped up a lot, I think, in the last six months. Dogecoin uh, is That's at a, what, it's way up too. It's a third of a cent. It's up eight yeah. percent. Um, so yeah, so just for the for poster posterity's sake, but uh, Nexus three point two, that's one that I hear a lot. Um, Iota would be one that you would hear often too. Uh, Everyone's but, all about Iota. Okay, it's like number four or five in the market cap. Gotcha. Okay, and then I uh, so you know back when you and I first met, Jeff, uh, back in two thousand nine two thousand ten. I mean, Bitcoin, I don't know what it was, but it was it was very low. It was very it's kind of like Litecoin was it this year where it was 30 you know, 3 Correct. cents. I mean, it was it was nascent and only libertarians talked about it and only like people with black and yellow flags on their profile picture talked about Bitcoin. And 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 no one no one had any clue. And even the ones who talked about it ne- weren't necessarily buying it. It was just this new government free currency and so you know everyone's interest gets peaked doesn't necessarily mean you're buying it at that time mm-hmm. and i was one of those people until recently mm-hmm. it's one of those things where oh bitcoin that sounds pretty cool i'll look into that someday yeah and then time keeps passing and the value stays low and then at some point you're like man i'm hearing bitcoin more and more often and you just dig into it and dig into it and i'm kind of like you i got in late but I've been reading about it and finally decided, hey, it's time to get some skin in the game. And, you know, you can't really understand it unless you buy some and then and then see where it goes. So, right. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, there were people who 2013, like, hey, can I donate to the program in Bitcoin? I would have gotten full Bitcoins. Like, I would have oh, gotten yeah. like you five multiples. I would have gotten like 10 Bitcoins over the course of like six months, you know, and I just it's like, I don't understand it. I don't know how to set all this stuff up. I don't want to deal with it. So I didn't. Now I'm regretting it. And I'm thinking about like all the, you know, libertarian Ron Paul girls who in 2009 were like, send me Bitcoins and I'll send you nudes. <laughs> like I wish, can't imagine how many of those girls are like re- super rich. I'm sure Ian Freeman's sitting on a pile of money today. Um, yeah. So it, I think for me, I had heard about it since 2009, 2010, but it, it was when Dogecoin came out and I was like, okay, this is all a joke because. Uh, it you know i understood the concept of fiat money because as i explained to my boss today it's kind of the same concept as your credit card like if you're if you're gonna people want to bash bitcoin and cryptocurrency as it's not backed by anything it's it's a bubble it's this or that i'm like you're really like not doing anything different than what we do with regular money you know you're you're talking about the us dollar which can be inflated massively to which steals your savings and it's bet on all the time and you know foreign exchanges and people bet against the dollar and they they write it up and down in in these currency exchanges so it's sort of the same thing with the dollar and then it's just sort of numbers on an app you know like (laughs) apple pay through my chase card i don't ever touch cash i don't have gold i don't have anything that's hard uh it's just all numbers in an app i mean so it's sort of the same concept it's whatever people put their faith into at this point which is the scary part because the u.s dollar used to be backed by gold and now it's backed by the full faith and credit of the united states well when roy moore and donald trump are the united states government there's not a lot of full faith and credit there so uh you're you're really talking about something that is numbers in an app and you know as roger paxton said he said the internet is the greatest tool for lib for freedom and liberty in human existence and number two is cryptocurrency because what it does is it detaches money from government systems who have the power to tax and inflate those dollars and control those dollars and steal basically from populations there and and tax so it through taxes so cryptocurrencies are 
I mean, do you guys think that it is the future of money? Uh, starting with me, yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I I don't think Bitcoin will be the end all be all by any means um, for reasons we can talk about later. But uh, I do believe if the the technology, the blockchain technology, will be something that currency uses moving forward. Um, whether that is issued, you know, through decree or if that is done, you know, through voluntary means, one of the two, it will become the norm for sure. Can you explain what blockchain is? Because this is the part where I get totally lost. Uh, so <laughs> this is a uh, kind of sort of difficult to say, but um, so when things get uh, put into what they call blocks, which is literally just like a an amount of information, right? So mm -hmm. um, they're usually limited in megabytes to what they'll actually be. So I think block uh, Bitcoin stuck, I think, at one still, okay. uh, which is part of the reason it's so slow. Um, because you get back up from processing. So anyway, uh, one megabyte, all this data fits in here, um, and then those things get processed, um, and those things get signed so with a hash, um, which is like a, a unique number. And that's what chains these together. So like this one will have a hash pointer when it gets made to mm -hmm. the one to the next one, and it has one from the one before. So they get they get linked through these like hash pointers. Um, and that's how, and then they get built on top of each other. So that's how you can go through. So like, so like, put it into English for me, and Jeff, jump in here if you can yeah. and translate what Jesse <laughs> just said. All right. But is it like a, a a train? You know, you have a train, but then in in each of the the coal cars is one megabit of data, and then the links for blocked Bitcoin. Right for bit of Bitcoin data. Right, and then linking each one of these chains, these megabits of data is that special hash yep. which is a special individual code between those two chains right and I, and I think the key is it's it's public and it's distributed right so this right. this chain this ledger correct whereas if it was at a bank the bank would be the only person to see that and if they manipulated it you would never know okay but with bitcoin and cryptocurrency For the and the part. blockchain it's distributed right so this person here has a copy of the chain and that hash and and all of that this person has it this person has it this person has it every, every person in the in the bitcoin exchange or every person who has a bitcoin like it, it, like, it's I, like the, it's the miners right so miners will have a copy uh and then nodes will have a copy so um full nodes would say so you can download an application off of Bitcoin.org. I believe that's where you can get it. Um, and that application can function as a wallet as well as a node. So you can send money to it, and then it will sit on your computer, and it will just start absorbing the blockchain. Um, and you will have a file on your computer that just continually grows to keep maintain a copy of the ledger. Um, so the nodes actually are crucial to the system because – that is what helps distribute it right so at, when block well, sorry when bitcoin was like not very popular you would you saw like nodes skyrocket when like bitcoin kind of took off in like, i think like 2010 or 2011 when a lot of people like first heard about it uh and then like nodes started going offline because popularity died uh, and then the resurgence you see nodes spike back up again you, there's a i think it's like bitnodes or bitnodes.io or something you can see are, are these, these nodes the actual computers that are doing mm -hmm. the mining no no no, the okay. miners are doing – they are com doing completely something different. They're helping confirm transactions. Okay. So when the transactions get put into the pool, the the nodes help push that around and, like, help, like, move it through the ledgers mm – -hmm. or, sorry, to the – sorry, through the nodes. Um, and then the miners will get those and then put them together. And then they have to solve a very complicated math problem, which mm -hmm. essentially uh, in Bitcoin, I believe, is – they have to generate a hash that is equal to or lower than the hash that they have there. Mm -hmm. That part is a little hazy to me, but like anyway, they they generate these hashes and they have no idea what the hash is, so they just keep generating them until they get a number that is lower than, and then they receive Bitcoin in order for that, and then like that fuses everything together. Okay, so it, the the nodes and the miners and the, the application that you download those. It's like a pool of computers talking to each other. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. So kind of like LimeWire, basically, like Napster back in the day. Napster was not peer to peer. Okay, but li like Li LimeWire 
because all, all those Morpheus things. Right. So, like, right. LimeWire, when I was downloading... So, to, to put it into terms that, like, I can understand, um, I put an MP3 on my computer. I've got 10 megabits of, uh, you know, Green Day. Right. Because <laughs> that's when LimeWire was coming out. I've got the album Nookie ready right. to ready to sell off to to the internet. I put it into the special folder. I upload it to the LimeWire system. My computer then starts talking to all the other LimeWire computers and applications, and those bits start to transfer amongst each other. For the ones that are asking for it, yeah. right? And so soon, my copy of Green Day's Nook. Uh, it's Nookie, right? No, you're I'm thinking of uh, you're thinking of Limp Biscuit. That's why yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Okay, I was like, right. I've got Limp Biscuit in the you're car. You're thinking dude. Dookie. We should hang out. Dookie, yes, Dookie. So yeah. let's go with Limp Biscuit because I was never a Green Day fan. <laughs> I'm a big Limp Biscuit fan. So I put up my co- a copy of Nookie, <laughs> and because uh, it's it's early 2000s, and uh, so my copy of Nookie then becomes a standard in, within the peer to peer computer system. Yeah. So am I close? They do hashing there too. That's how they know like. That's how they knew which files were the same. Mm-hmm. So they would say, oh, this hash matches this hash. These are the same files. And then they knew who to pull from. Okay. So it's – hashing is very important when it comes to, like, serialization and stuff. So, um, yeah. Because, like, hashing is really important when it comes to Internet security because it's, it's like, is it a form of encryption? Like, how does hashing work? Yeah. So um, I can't – I'm not a cryptographer, and I don't play one on this podcast – but, um, but yeah, essentially you're taking data, uh, and then, uh, depending on which algorithm you use, it generates a string of fixed length, uh, for each data it receives. So it could be a bunch of data. It could be one little letter, but it will be a representation by a fixed length of numbers and digits, alphanumeric, mm-hmm. I should say. So, okay. So. I mean, anything yeah, to scary. add to kind of the technical aspect of all this? No, I was I was thinking, okay, your example with the CD, right? You you distribute it to the nodes, so you've got your Dookie album out there. But I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the difference is you don't just put it out there for anyone. In the case of, say, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, right. you want to send that album to a specific person mm-hmm. right. or just a couple songs from that album to a specific person. And once they're gone they belong here and not to you anymore right and all these nodes that's going out to they are all keeping track of that transaction Correct. and building that chain to say okay on this day at this time chris spangle gave two songs from his dookie album to jeff erdman yep. and they're his now mm-hmm. Correct. and that's where this distributed comes in like yep. like all of these peer networks all agree that that happened mm-hmm. exactly and no one can take it back yeah, because if you could, that's really why Bitcoin take off took off is we've had this stuff like there's this thing called the Merkle tree and all this stuff that and the blockchain that the, itself like the concept of it has been around for a very I want to say a super long time but for a while uh, before Bitcoin ever came around. So you mean like twenty years? <laughs> yeah, well, it was <laughs> like, like in internet terms. I was reading like about some stuff. Yeah, it was like the eighties or nineties, like this concept of putting things together. Um, so yeah, the the nodes are kind of coming to a consensus of what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is what prevents double spin, which was the biggest problem. And okay. so pretty much what like Satoshi Nakamoto solved or put forth in the Bitcoin white paper was a way to prevent double spin. Okay. And as soon as like, they're like, Oh, you know, we can actually use this to create the currency now. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the nodes help prevent double spin, and that is why it's important to have all those nodes because you could, if you controlled all, like a mass generation of nodes, you could alter the blockchain and kind of like lie to it. Okay, so what he did is he you can't spend something twice yeah, or you can't or put say, up two files and like if I this is kind of getting the smart contracts or whatever, but you can't like put a a file here and give this a file. It's going to come to a consensus and say, "No, you did this." Okay. So, um, so if I put an an order to buy a Bitcoin, all the nodes are going to say, "No, Chris Bangle only gets one, right? One eighteenth of of a Bitcoin, for instance." Right. Okay. So, and Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, no, no uh, proof. Satoshi. Satoshi. There's no proof, uh, but there's also been no denial from Harry Price that he is Satoshi Nakamoto, <laughs> um, but. He is the the kind of the quote unquote founder of Bitcoin. He's the entity. 
So I guess th this complicated algorithm and math and nodes and all of this, this is what keeps people, what I would say, uh, I would call myself in a lot of ways normies. Like I'm a normie in a lot of ways, and I'm trying to translate the the world that the libertarian world to normies <laughs> and in an effort to bring no more normies into the libertarian world. Uh, and I think this complicated technical aspect of it where it's very hard to conceptualize is what we why people like me early on just didn't get into it people get fixated on it yeah and i'm i know that there are people and listen this is high level for idiot stuff i'm the idiot and there i'm sure there are listeners of ours that are tearing their hair out right now yeah. going i could have explained that better <laughs> or you forgot this part and like I get that, and we can we can. We're sorry. Once I kind of get my grasp of what this stuff means, then we can have those deeper level conversations. But you Bitcoin crazed nut jobs who have been in this since two thousand and nine, like give the rest of us a chance to kind of catch up. So that's what we're doing here, and I think that complicated aspect is why a lot of us just haven't. And then there's like a million different ways to get in, and like. Roger Paxton said, you should try Helium. And then I tried to sign up for Helium or uh, no, it was Dash. You should buy some Dash coin. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know which exchange to pick. You know, I don't know how to get into Ripple. I'd like to. My boss said, like, I can tell you how to get into Bitcoin. Go buy the Coinbase app because right. they made it easy for me. Right. I don't even understand it, but I just go, okay, well, these guys are adding 100,000 a day. The market is saying these guys are probably decent players in the market in terms of not being pieces of garbage friends that i respect and understand this say coinbase is safe whereas like some of these other coins you just don't know how to get into it so it's it's just very confusing but i think the first and foremost like i can conceptualize gold there's 130 million ounces of gold in the world and that's all there will ever be or whatever the number is and so that that rarity, that cap on it, and then dividing the gold and splitting it and melting it down and splitting it into coins and well, here's an ounce and let's melt this down and put it into 800 coins and this equals an ounce and this price is – I get that math, but I don't quite get what gives cryptocurrency its value. Like what makes it valuable? Is there scarcity to this that makes this valuable? Uh, yeah, so – I, mean, I don't know if you want to go first. We can switch or whatever. But <laughs> uh, I struggle. I struggle with this very question, right? I mean, they say, okay, well, there's only 21 million, right? Right. Oh, oh, there's scarcity, so they must have value because you can't inflate it, right? But why is it valuable still? If mm -hmm. there's 20 of them or 21 million of them, right? How do you value it, right? And what gives it that intrinsic value? Right. I mean, there's yeah, there's only a limited number of like original Taipei babies, but Right, they're damn near worthless. We've, exactly, we've agreed as a society that baby beanies are no longer baby beanies are these beanies are not worth any pogs right. are not worth anything. I want to bring pogs back, but right. that's a separate issue. <laughs> I have a whole lot of pogs <laughs> in my mom's attic that I could sell. We should play sometime. So I guess you know, as Rick Irvine says, market demand sets the value. Yeah, that's what I said in my notes. Um, and to the you know that essentially that's what it is. That's what I, I find this like a really beautiful thing is because again we don't have any like central authoritative figures issuing or entities whatever issuing a currency through voluntarism we have chosen stuff we are actively engaging actively mm -hmm. accepting um trying to improve and i think the value might be inflated but the value is still there there's a huge amount of value so yeah the, the 21 million uh that's specific to bitcoin um some cryptocurrencies uh have more than that so that's kind of like why litecoin is valued less in theory right like i think uh there's supposed to be like 88 it's like one third of whatever uh bitcoin is roughly so um you know that the scarcity itself is that yeah like there's never going to be more than 21 million and we already know that there's going to be less than 21 million because they keep getting lost and stolen so that in itself is going to just the people are going to keep losing them <laughs> because i think that's, i read that's somewhere problem. up to 20 percent has already been lost oh yeah they're like they're and I, will never be recovered i know hmm. people who got into it before i did and like they're like 
like it's on a hard drive somewhere i'm like bring it to the office and i will find this and you can pay me a percentage right um because it's worth my time yeah someone just commented in the chat that you know gold is pretty so that's why we have determined that it has value right uh, and there's really no value to just this piece of metal. It's just the fact that human beings have agreed that this thing has value. Right. And that's a pretty, I mean, and if you look at the stock market, for instance, uh, yes, there are hard assets within a company, but they're, you know, like a media company like this. There's a value to We Are Libertarians. Right. Like the hard asset value of it is very little. Like if you were to, acquire my company the board the microphones a couple grand you're gonna yeah you're gonna sell it for very little but the ability to reach tens of thousands of people right uh is is the real value of the company and that's based on faith if uh it comes out that i'm bill cosby 2.0 then the company loses all its real value right. leo laporte leo laporte has very little real hard assets in twit for instance in this week in tech Leo Laporte is the value and his company makes $10 million a year because he exists, right. you know? And so you're really just kind of, it's really the full faith and credit. It's the full faith of Leo Laporte's reputation and what credit we're willing to give him. So in, in criticizing Bitcoin, you're really not, you're really just kind of parroting prop anti Bitcoin propagandist tech uh, commentary. Yep. People who don't want you to take your ten thousand dollars and put it into Bitcoin into a highly speculative market, they want you to put it with them in an ETF that's going to get you twenty one percent over the course of ten years. So, a lot of these people who are criticizing cryptocurrency are not telling you the whole truth because they they have a vested interest in you staying in the traditional institutions of financial investing and the currency that we use every single day. They don't want us opting out. Right. I, and I think that's why I think it's, I don't want to call it a bubble because I just don't, but I think that it is overvalued um, because people are looking for their short term, short term gains. Like mm -hmm. no, no one, I want to say no one, very, very, very few people as far as a percentage um, actually want to keep using Bitcoin for a currency, right? right. Most people are looking for short term gains for USD that's what they're doing and I, I think the reason we're seeing this huge explosion um is twofold two sided not really two sided but two things have gone into it one the same reason you didn't get into it or you probably didn't get into it and a lot of people didn't get into it and the reason i didn't get into it is because it was very hard to obtain mm. um right so like back in the day like coinbase didn't exist right so like getting it was like i have to sign up with some shoddy exchange and hope that I can like put some money on it and then get it. And then like the, I still get like really like butterflies in my stomach when I'm trying to send crypto across the wire, because it's still not a good fluid system. Like mm. you're like, I'm going to put this hash here for this, you know, this wallet address and send it. And you hope that you've got it right. Because if you don't, it can go into the ether and it will never come back. Well, that would be a problem for me. Uh, yeah, it's, it can be scary. Right. I've done it before. Yeah, I, a coworker at work, he signed up for Coinbase, and uh, they they went to pull an ETF, an exchange trade, you know, out of his bank account, fifty bucks, and it didn't go through. They didn't, his account didn't work or whatever, and so they just said, "Eh, we'll cancel that." Sent his fifty dollars back. You know, and so he has the ease of talking to the company to get out of that. Right. Whereas it didn't seem like two years ago you even even had something like that on some of these exchanges. Yeah, I mean, some of like Coinbase again is pretty reputable. It's got a lot of money backing it, a lot of big names. Uh, one of the, I think it was one of the founders of Netscape or Mozilla or, or Fox or something. One of the guys, are, yeah, Netscape, um, is backing them. He owns a big investment firm now. But uh, yeah, um. The, a lot of exchanges are still sketchy. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, you can easily get into Coinbase and buy a couple hundred dollars worth of crypto. Mm. Most exchanges, like, you have to, you cannot, ex like, usually withdraw without proving some sort of ID. Mm. Um, mm. So, at least that's how, like, the most of them are moving, moving to that way. And I think that's because they know they're going to go down soon or get infiltrated, which is the biggest right. 
problem right now with crypto. Which explain that, please. So, um, the, the I don't when this stuff was all coming out, like when Bitcoin got um, written, I don't think like Satoshi wanted exchanges to be a part of the picture. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is really the only way we can get these things to like move fast. And what has happened is you get a lot of people myself included and others who are putting all of this money on and kind of breaking trust by putting storing our wallets which when we talk about wallets on here because we haven't really dove into the, these um the lexicon of crypto mm-hmm. but a wallet is essentially a file and that file is essentially like a digital version of the wallet that you would carry with you every day right mm-hmm. So you have your coins in your wallet, and that wallet, it would be like taking your wallet and putting it at the bank. Okay. Right? And maybe a security deposit box or something. And there's nothing preventing the feds from coming into your bank and taking that from you mm-hmm. um, versus it being in your house or just somewhere else. Sure. Um, it's very easy for them to come in and just take your shit. And we've seen in, like, Greece, where Greece did the haircut, where Greece basically said, hey, we're in financial trouble. We're going to cut. Freeze accounts. We're going to take 10% of everybody's bank accounts, and that's just ours now. Yep. That happened in Greece and led to rioting. Yeah. And um, so, um, word of advice, if you're doing this and you're really serious about it and you're going to put a lot of money in, I would not keep that stuff at the exchange if possible. The problem with that is it makes it harder to understand because you have to manage your wallets. Okay. Um, there are, like, multi-coin wallets around. Uh, one for the iPhone is called Jax, J-A-X-X. Um, and the other is Coinami for Android. Mm-hmm. Um, those are probably the two popular ones. Uh, I'm sure somebody else can chime in and, uh, online or if anybody else here knows. Uh, other multi-coin wallets. Um, but uh, I would put those... I would try to get my coins out of the exchange if you plan on holding or hodling them for a, a very long time. Uh, here's what we're going to do. So because we're going to leave stuff out of this episode that is probably need to know because we only have so long and our, our knowledge only goes so deep. Uh, so if you want to get in on the discussion and you want to ask a question or if you want to uh, amend something that you heard in this program – Go to WeAreLibertarians.com, and if you scroll down on the right-hand sidebar or on your phone, you've got to scroll to the bottom because of the way that the mobile site's set up. You can join our Facebook group, and we've got about 1,300 people in there, and there's a lot of people I've seen over the last couple months as our audience has wanted to get into uh, crypto. They've asked questions of the group, and there's been a lot of knowledgeable people in that group to give a lot of good answers so if you want to ask questions that you don't have answered here, then please join our Facebook group. And uh, we've got a lot of people in there that can help you or join the Discord, uh, which is also there as well. Uh, those people are hardcore crypto people. Uh, and so they can help you out as well. So, And, yeah, and if you feel like we missed something, please let us know. So um, I hear a lot of tulip mania can either of you explain tulip mania and exactly <laughs> exactly what that means? I know it has something to do with like Holland or the Netherlands or that's the same thing or Denmark so, or whatever. I'll try to explain it in, in layman's terms or, or, you know, useful idiot terms. <laughs> so, you know, the, uh, in Holland, right. The tulips, as I understand it came from somewhere else. They were this new great thing that no one understood only rich people could have them because they were the only ones that could afford them and they wanted them in mass quantities. And so the price of tulips just went up and up and up and up and up until it finally came crashing down because there's no real reason for tulips to cost what they cost. It was just a mania. And am I completely off base here? No, I, from I I've the first time I won't say it's the first time I've heard of tulip mania, but uh, the first time I actually cared to like kind of look into it was um, uh, Glenn Beck did a special. I won't say it's a special on part of his show. He did some Bitcoin stuff a couple of days ago, uh, and he talked to Charlie Lee, who was the uh, founder creator of Litecoin, uh, which is typically referred to as Bitcoin's silver. If Bitcoin is gold, Litecoin would be silver. Um, and 
he was like, he's like, uh, why isn't this like tulip mania and whatever? So I was like, what the hell are they talking about? So yeah, I kind of looked into it. I looked into it a little bit more today. Um, and yeah, from what I can tell, it was something reserved for the upper middle class and ex- the rich. And it was something that they would buy into. Um, and it, yeah, it, like artificially inflated the cost of tulips. Yeah. During the Dutch Republic in 1637, uh, it was the first recorded speculative bubble. So, which is probably why we still talk about it. Um, it only lasted for like a year. Right. So, or so. so, yeah, it's kind of the most famous crash. It's it's <laughs> metaphorically used for anything. I mean, tulip mania, I've heard about it as, you know, during the Tea Party years when people were talking about the U.S. dollar, that we're going to get hyperinflation. It will be like uh, tulip mania. So, it, it it's... I mean, is it something? I mean, I I have to think that like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is in a bubble at this point. I mean, what do what do you guys think? I, I think it's in a bubble, but I don't see that personally. I don't think that the bubble is going to burst any time in the short or medium term. Right. But I have no real reason. I mean, how how do you know that, right? Because right. unlike stocks where you can look at a financial statement and say this is the value based on earnings times a multiple, what's again, what gives Bitcoin its value? Just what people are willing to pay for it. Right. right. And how do you temper that against some other measure to know if it's over or undervalued or what it is? I think we're still in that market discovery mode. And right. as long as the normies are getting into it, it's just going to keep going up because there's no reason for it not to. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's going to go up until people can afford it. But the problem is, is that it can, it's a fractional currency, right? So like you don't just go and buy one Bitcoin, you go and buy a partial Bitcoin. Um, it goes up to the eighth power, or not the eighth power, but like to the eighth decimal place. So you could buy point zero to the seventh plus one, uh, one or whatever. And it's probably wrong math, but I'm, you, I you, but, <laughs> you could, but like, that's part of it is, is if I get the Robin Hood app and I want to buy stocks, right? I have to buy a stock on like the Robin Hood app if I want to just be purely speculative on my phone. Okay. And I've got a hundred bucks to play with. I can put fifty in Robin Hood and fifty in, in Coinbase to put between the three that are in there. Because like this is kind of what I've been doing a little bit. Like with the Robin Hood app, you can invest, you can go and do research and invest in a company and there's a the very slow growth with it. You know, something like Stash, which is a cool app that you can invest, you know, partial or a monthly into ETFs and it grows. It's mine has grown 0.05%, you know, but it's really about long term savings. Whereas with Coinbase, it's like I made $150 in two weeks. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And, and I got out the second it looked like it was starting to go down yesterday just because I'm like, you know, FUD. I'm, I'm like, I may, I I had a good run. Like I'm never I'm not the type of person who's really going to use Bitcoin. I might use it as a currency. I don't know, but like I'm not at a point in my discovery of this new marketplace where I could tell you how to spend a Bitcoin. Like I would love to take Bitcoins because I see there's value to people and I could see how this long term could be a great escape from the fiat money system. But I don't know how to use it as real money at this point and I'm sure there are plenty of people who are investing in mobile apps who are about to solve that problem for me. And then that's really when you're going to see a lot of growth because then people are going to go, oh, maybe I can. Right now, I think it's kind of a novelty for a lot of people. You know, for, for people like me who understand that this is a secure technology, that this is something that uh, is, has, is a volatile thing. Like Bitcoin got up to 1,000 and everybody got real excited and then it dropped significantly. Yeah. You know, and then it's it's like 200, 200 right. Feet. It's it's a free market, and with free markets, you get a lot of ups and downs. And and I think it's in, in a lot of ways a great way to teach people about what life with a free market would actually look like, because this is how a free market would actually operate, where you're going to have sudden crashes, and you, you there's going to be consequences, so you better prepare for that, and in, in your long term planning. Yep. Um, but and, there will be recovery. Exactly. Quickly. Within within a very short amount of time, it recovers quickly. So I look at it as a great opportunity. I think that it is in a price bubble right now, but long term, I think you're going to see a lot of people jumping into it and uh, really 
it, it, it's it's not going to bottom out at 800. I mean, I think there's there's going to be a floor with it, and I think we're not at that we're not at the peaks of this. I think we're still in the basement. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I think it's. Uh, I was reading something the other day, or I was watching a video or a movie or not movie, sorry, um, listening to a podcast, and someone was talking about it would have to reach like fifty thousand dollars or something and order it for it to be at the same market cap as gold mm-hmm. or something. I, I can't remember what the relationship was, but I mean, yeah, it's. I guess it is possible. I don't understand. You know, I'm not going to dare to say I understand market caps enough growth for Bitcoin because to me, I believe it's overvalued right now. Um, I think it is people, it's FOMO, fear of missing out. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's what it is, and people are just blindly throwing money at it, not understanding what the fees are, the transaction fees are, because uh, Coinbase is going to take some money from you. Uh, not only that, but you do have to pay the Bitcoin network uh, when you do transactions, and sometimes that can be upwards to uh, anywhere between 15 and 20 bucks on a transaction, so you better hope you're, spend, you're sending over $20. Um, at one time I went, so we have a Bitcoin ATM up on Allisonville mm. and I went up there with my friend Mark and I was, I was like, kind of get him to buy into some crypto. And I said, Hey, let's go to this ATM. I want to check this out. I want to feel this experience cause I've not felt it yet. So, um, we drove up there and I, I bought some Bitcoin on my way up there from Coinbase. Mm-hmm. And then when I got there, like I wanted to cash out and I, I forget what it took from me, but. ATMs, just FYI, if you if you do want to purchase Bitcoin, you can buy from an ATM. Uh, they typically are going to be um, charge you a higher rate, um, and they're usually for those who have ever bought silver or gold, their spot price for Bitcoin is extremely overpriced. Um, but there is a little bit more anonymity to it. So, what's that word? Anonymity and and anonymity. Anonymity. Yeah. Anonymity. Anonymity. Yeah, you're anonymous. Anonymous. Okay. Anonymity. Anonymity. Right. anonymity. I was like, is that some sort of super crypto tech word? I don't know. But, I, I, maybe right. I'm saying it wrong. I yeah. don't know. Anon. Um, anon. Yeah. I don't anonymity. Know. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're from Indiana. We don't know. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so I got, I got my car and I said, all right, I'm going to show you Bitcoin and why it sucks in my opinion. So I sent him a dollar. And Bitcoin, like the you, mm-hmm. whatever a Bitcoin was, it it cost me two dollars to send it to him, hmm. and he's sitting right next to me in my car. Right. So I was like, the, and then I was like, and you're not going to get it for like at least an hour. Hmm. I was right. like, so this is the problem we have right now. Um, so Bitcoin right now transactions, it can only handle about seven transactions per second. Okay. So yeah, it's a massive problem inside the Bitcoin. Network. It's not a problem for all crypto. That's just a, a problem specifically for Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, all blockchains have transaction issues, um, but some of the fastest are, like, sub-minute. Um, well, sorry, I said that wrong. That's confirmation time. Some of them are faster than others. Like, the 7 kind of deals with how, how big that block is. Okay. Um, and, if, and that's kind of why Bitcoin forked. Uh, for people that don't know what a fork is, it's kind of like taking the code base of Bitcoin, copying it, and then starting something new with it. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of what happened. There was like a hard fork and people went with Bitcoin cash. Um, a lot of people who were really crucial to Bitcoin's growth jumped to Bitcoin cash. Okay. Um, and it's hovering uh, about $2,000 today. Uh, this happened back in August. So, um, they increased the block size so they could get more transactions through and keep the transaction rates down. So the, again, this is the free market trying to, solve these problems um albeit there are organizations or committees you know your favorite word um behind these things to kind of like vote them what happens to the actual projects themselves okay so jesse and i sit on the state central committee of the libertarian party of indiana it's very slow to get anything done because you've got people from across the state getting together in a room once a quarter to have a discussion you got to persuade people to your opinion i'm i'm very opinionated and anti certain things so is jesse uh we usually see eye to eye but if we disagreed we'd argue with each other um and so anytime you have a committee it's very hard to get things done so you're saying every one of these cryptocurrencies is backed by like a committee like that making decisions on the the i mean there's like 
it seems like there's hundreds of these things, but let's, you know, let's tailor it to like the top five or top 10 or whatever. All right. But just in general, let's. So good thing. you. I think you said the top five dash is around there. So dash is one of the, when I abandoned Bitcoin uh, a few years ago, I bought in a dash at like three fifty three dollars okay. and fifty cents. Um, the what really appealed to me with well, dash, then would you love to donate to We Are Libertarians? At this point? <laughs> I still haven't cashed out. Okay. So well, when um, you do, let me know. But I've switched from Daddy dash. needs a new microphone. I've switched from dash. So, um, so what I did, or sorry, the reason I chose dash was um, I saw that the node issue that I've talked about earlier, where nodes were in decline. Um, and this is a big problem with Bitcoin. I don't know why Bitcoin Cash hasn't fixed this, but whatever. Um, so what Dash ended up doing uh, is Dash is also a fork from Bitcoin. Um, and they implemented some anonymity to the to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is pseudo-anonymous. Like we said, it's a public ledger. If you share your wallet address your public wallet address because you have a public and private key that's how you get in and out of your wallet if you share your public which is what you give to people it's like giving them your phone number they can send you bitcoin as long as anyone knows what that is they can track when you're receiving your ins and outs of your wallet Mm. so that's why it's not anonymous it's pseudo anonymous and by that it's it's kind of like my definition of vip where it's only intellectual property until you tell someone else about it Right. So uh, if, until you publicize your wallet, then it's public and everyone knows who you are on the blockchain. Uh, so Dash added layers of security, uh, not security, but uh, privacy to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they also brought in this concept of what they call a master node. So um, they still have mining. But if you owned 10,000 Dash, you could become what you call a master node and you would also get rewarded for being keeping your node online. Okay. Um, so uh, that was kind of what interests me. And I tried to get people to buy in at the time, which would have only cost us like, oh, no, it was a thousand dash. That's what you needed at the time. And I was like, well, you know, we can spend 3,500 bucks and then we'll have like this revenue generator that we can just operate as a company. Uh, and the guys I worked with at the time were like, again, I don't know what crypto is, whatever. You're right. Yeah. Full of shit. I'm like, no, guys, I'm telling you. And today, <laughs> that, like when we say dash was $950. Yeah. Yeah, so we would have got fifty percent of the the reward, wow, um, for every transaction or some. I don't know if it's every transaction, but the way that it works out, there's a way. There's a calculator that tells you what you pay out. So anyway, they're incentivizing people to keep the network up. Those people also get voting rights and dash. Okay, so they people look at that as like centralization because you have master nodes running, um, and I would kind of agree with that. Like people who got in early kind of got like, you know, a it's like shooting someone in the foot and before a race, like they're already ahead. <laughs> but you, you also kind of, I mean, if you're getting in, you should know what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. That was my art. That's right. how I've morally dealt with this is like, right. if you got in at the bleeding edge, that means you're really close to this. Sure. And you're probably pretty passionate about it. Right. So you are the people who I want voting on things, but yeah, you could, you could run into like the, the Roman problem where, you know, only the patricians are running everything, but right. You know, that's – but you have the freedom to leave and right. go to a different coin if you really wanted to cash exactly. out. Okay, so so yeah, and a couple of comments from, from the chat here on the Facebook live video feed in, in this private Patreon Facebook group. Um, mining has become harder in Bitcoin, and so that is, that is limiting it, and so that is leading people to kind of go elsewhere. And really whoever solves the usability problem – is really going I mean Bitcoin is not the coin it's not the it's the Kleenex right now but that this is a very rapidly changing industry it seems and uh as long as the government doesn't start regulating which they're they're trying to Diane Feinstein you are the worst um I think it's Senate Bill 1231 there's a uh, house bill thing in here too yeah it's I think it's Senate Bill 1231 that's being discussed right now we 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 it's in one of our previous shows in the title. Bitcoin's in the title, It's and we talked about it. Um, it was last Tuesday. Uh, so whoever solves that usability problem, like the when I really started like paying attention was when I talked to Roger Paxton in our last League of Liberty show, which is for our Patreon subscribers only, uh, where I get together with my three other close uh, podcasting friends in the libertarian movement, and we do a show together. 
and he was talking about Dash and how Dash has the ability you can buy all kinds of different things in New Hampshire with Dash. Like oh, you can really? go to the grocery store and restaurants and dry cleaning and all kinds of things with Dash. And it's become very easy to use. It's faster than Bitcoin. Yeah, and and like the up what what is the the wallet that um like helium and well, helium. dash needs um oh. but it is hold on just a second it is uphold and you can buy dash pretty easily with that it looks like so I don't even know that. but yeah so and it, it's to me the coin that becomes like the 800 pound gorilla in the room is going to be whoever has the ease of use and part of what makes our current banking system so easy to use, like I'm a Chase customer. I, I couldn't, couldn't imagine being a small banking customer like with Chase. They have such huge amounts of cash on hand that they can float a lot of different things for me. You know, if you quick pay me $200, I get that money immediately. Well, you don't technically have that money immediately. That's why you have pending transactions it may take five days for that money to clear. Right. You know, when I get my direct deposit tomorrow at 4 a.m., like that money's not technically mine yet. It's not been completely transferred to me. Chase is giving me a loan on it, right. but they can do it because they have such huge amounts of cash. So I, I, know, I have no information. This is just a guess. But I would say that if like a J.P. Morgan Chase gets in on a Ripple coin and can lend to it the right amount of cash so you can start floating some of these times to make it instantaneous you have the network already with things like chase pay and zelle and relationships with all these major corporations so you can start rolling out an apple pay like feature with your your currency you have the the capital to build an entire tech team to start creating something so like to me something like a ripple is is probably a smart move because once you get these big banks these big banking institutions into the game then you're going to see some of these coins start to they have the experience they know we have to make it easy to pay that's what's going to make this coin survive like to me bitcoin is is a, a speculative pr play like it's not a currency to me so it isn't something that I'm going to use long term because I don't know how to use it. Like if, if it were more advantageous for me to use Bitcoin as a currency than the United States dollar, I totally would. So um, but I would also say that when you play with a JP Morgan Chase, you're playing by elite institutional rules. Yep. People that control the finance of not only the United States uh, government, but the world, the world, world Bank. You know, Jamie Dimon is one of the elite bankers in the world, and they control the money, and so therefore they control world governments, and they, you know, they're the globalists that Alex Jones rants against. And so they're not necessarily going to be friendly to a cryptocurrency that they can't control. So when you start getting these big banking institutions into the game, they're going to make it really easy to use to try and kill off the smaller independent bitcoins of the world so you can use ease of use but you're also giving up the thing that makes it special which is the lack of government and banking institutional control so it's a it's a double-edged sword there in my mind i mean tell me if i'm wrong no I, I think you're right i think the the biggest reason why crypto hasn't been picked up is because of usability right i think that's why coinbase is good for people uh because it it is it has made getting in the door easier um but like you said uh if paxton asked you to get dash it was if you think it's hard today you should have seen me trying to buy it two years ago right it was a pain in the ass and i kept placing orders and like i would say hey i want this many dash and like i would get an order through and i was like why don't i have all my shit and they would be like, well they, we don't have a supply for it yeah i was like what do you mean you don't have a supply for it? Like, we don't have it to give to you. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, all right. So then I had to, like, go and source my dash from, like, three different places. Hmm. And I, I think I walked out with, like, 37 of them total in the last, like, two years. Hmm. And then I sold them all in August when it was, like, 450 bucks or something a dash hmm. uh, for Pivix because people said I was going to name drop it. But Pivix is a, <laughs> a fork of dash, um, and they do even more things to – um to make it a little bit more secure, they've created a thing called um, 
they didn't create it, but one of the guys that's on the the developing team, uh, it's called uh, Zero Coin or Zero Lib is a library. Um, to it literally makes it completely anonymous. So, okay. um, uh, it, it's I don't even want to get in the weeds because I don't fully understand it. It's but P I V X. If P-I-V-X, people want to go yeah. in and research it, it's uh, today it was like four or something, and uh, before I got here it was five. 75 hmm. um so i think i made like almost a thousand dollars today like, <laughs> that's how much it's fluctuated I, again i own a, a, a stupid amount of this but <laughs> <laughs> yeah it dropped back to 539 so i've lost probably 500 dollars since we sat here well there's no F- <laughs> i mean but see there's there's risk to this because there is no F- I, fdic like right. if you just lose your wallet you're you're screwed right, right. like if, if coinbase just folds and they have a server outage i'm i'm out of luck right well that, and that's why i'm saying like and that's why it's very clear to pe- what people need to understand is you're not putting your money into an account like a bank account you're putting money in a physical well, i won't say physical a virtual wallet so if you lost your wallet at the park the fdic is not going to replace your 50 bucks right it, it's the yeah. same concept it's yeah. and that's what you have to kind of remember is like okay this isn't a, a institution this is a currency these people are hosting it if that's where you put your stuff is in some sort of cloud. If it gets lost there, they're probably not going to protect you either. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you might pay something monthly for some sort of backup service that has like 99.9% uptime and like off, you know, tapes that they can pull back if things go badly. Um, but if it was to get stolen, you, you're screwed. Like you're not going to get it back. I just remember I lost a hundred dollars once as a kid and my, mo- be awful. and my mom goes, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I go, you're not going to give me a hundred dollars. I'm feeling sad. And she goes, your feelings are not my financial problem. I right. was like 10. I was like, Oh shit. Capitalism is bullshit. <laughs> Where's Obama? Right. Where's Obama and the FDIC <laughs> to make me feel better? Uh, Rick says, put it into a hardware wallet. What is a hardware wallet? Uh, so yeah. So, um, there are different ones and the, it's Trezor. I always want to say something else. So I'm looking at the notes because I'm cheating because this is complicated stuff. So Trezor uh, is one of the more popular wallets. It's been around, I think, longer than the other one, which is Ledger. Um, Trezor is more expensive. I remember I was listening to Anarchast and years ago, and they were you know pimping Trezor and Ledger. Um, the biggest complaints I have for hardware wallets are that they don't support... A ton of crypto so if you're doing like the top five or probably the top three you're probably fine but if you're out if you scope outside of that um some of them don't support a ton of things and i don't i don't know how that works i don't know if the devs have to like work with those the companies that provide the hardware wallets or what that relationship looks like but um I do know the dev teams are typically responsible for getting on exchanges and working with exchanges. So it's not like the exchanges go out and say, Hey, we want to pick you up. It's usually the dev teams reaching out to them and then everybody coalescing and coming together. So, um, but yeah, Trezor ledger. And then there was like a clone. Somebody took like the, the Trezor code base, I believe, and created another one called keep key, keep key, which actually has a really nice interface. It, Trezor looks like your your phone from like 1990. <laughs> okay. It, it's a very mechanical looking device. Uh Keep Key is a little bit more modern esque. Like it's uh I would say it's about the size of a credit card it looks like and maybe a half inch to a quarter three quarters of an inch thick. Um and it has I think a bigger LED screen. And, and these are kind of like uh buying an external hard drive for your Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah, they're offline and it just stores it like they get stored on there. And, uh, some of them have like backup services attached to them, which again, to me kind of defeats the purpose, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like those are, those are three brands you can look into if you're looking to store your coins in a hardware wallet. I don't know if you have any more to add to that. So how, I guess I would add another question to the resident expert here. Sure. What would be the benefit of a hardware wallet versus a paper wallet? If you're if you're just hodling or right. whatever, uh, I'll, some so I will say with these, like Trezor and Ledger, I don't know if Trezor can be updated over network. If someone online knows that, they can definitely shoot like let us know. But the v- current version of Ledger, the Ledger Nano S, uh, cannot be updated like just sitting on the table or sitting in your drawer or wherever. Uh, they have a new one coming out, or it is out, but it gets really bad reviews. 
um, that is Bluetooth, so you could like sync to it and then do some transferring so that we don't have to connect it. But as far to me, I don't know what the benefit is over a paper like versus hardware. I don't know why one would choose. I guess like the biggest thing is you can keep adding to it versus where if you printed one, you'd have to like. I don't know. Just like, keep a big folder of printouts with. Uh... What the hell is a paper wallet? What are you people talking about? <laughs> so yeah, you can talk about them if you want. <laughs> so you know we're talking about okay, you buy some, buy some. It's either you can keep it on Coinbase in the exchange, yep. which we said don't do in mm-hmm. case they go under. You can get this hardware wallet, which keeps all of the the public and private key on a piece of hardware, basically a USB drive, right? Or you can basically print out on a piece of paper all of the key information to create that wallet, and it's completely offline. Cool. Correct. Yeah. So it has zero chance of getting hacked right? because it's all the information is printed out on a piece of paper. And then you can put that in a firebox Correct. next to your grandmother's pearls or whatever. Right. Correct. Now, if you lose the piece of paper, you're screwed. You're screwed. <laughs> but yeah. but it's very secure and you don't have to pay a hundred or how however much dollars these hardware wallets are if it's not something that if if you're not exchanging it often right right i personally i would spend more money on a hardware wallet than i have in crypto right now so yeah they're i mean the the ledger is the more um frugal purchase you could make it's you can buy it off a of ledger's website in euros for and i think it equals out in usd to like 75 bucks you can buy it on Amazon from a U.S. shipper for about ninety nine dollars, uh, and, and then you can purchase from eBay also for about seventy seven bucks last night. So okay, and and yeah, so an Airbits was something that Harry Price recommended, uh, and Harry made a good point in the in the chat here. Paper has if you you print something out on your uh, your you know my Canon printer that Ryan Ripley graciously donated to We Are Libertarians on our Amazon wish list. Um, which I use all the time, as you can tell. Double up, double up, double up, double up. This will fade. Right. You know? Like, this this ink on this paper will fade, and if it's 20 years from now, that, that, that could be a real problem. So, so you got to be careful. But I, I just wanted to cover before we start jumping into a few more questions here. Um, we've been answering questions. We just haven't been shouting out names. Uh, but um, online... What kind of wallets are there online? Coinbase, Bitrex. It's too close to Bitner for me. Binance, B-I-N-A-N-C-E. On the desktop, Bitcoin Core, Altcoin Cores, Multibit, Hive. Mobile wallets on Android, Mycelium with a C. Coin wallets, Coinium, iPhone, Jax, J-A-X-X, Coinbase. I I couldn't tell you how to pay with my Coinbase wallet, though. Well, yeah, you can. Yeah, I'm sure you can. I just, I guess, I haven't looked into it at all. Or no, whatever, you can't. But... So typically, um, when it comes to, I guess you're talking about like being doing commerce with it. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I guess like if I do find some place, let's say Amazon starts, and I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Amazon's going to start their own cryptocurrency that you can then buy into, right? You know, and then you know, because Amazon already runs half Everything. of the world. Uh, <laughs> They own ships that they ship stuff from China, or at least they were looking into it. Right. Yeah. So um, I was going to say, but there is a service. One of the more popular ones, and I, there's definitely more now, but one of the more popular ones at the time was BitPay. Um, you can set up stuff with Coinbase to accept crypto and also pay with crypto. So um, I would say I've done all my – I've I've spent Bitcoin um, – mostly giving to wikipedia during, mm-hmm. during christmas so i typically will either go out of my way to buy bitcoin which i will not do this year so hopefully they accept litecoin or something else mm-hmm. um but because of the fees um but i would typically if if i didn't already own some bitcoin because back then i used to carry a little bit more than i do i don't carry any now um but i think last year i and i didn't have any so i went and bought some and used that to send to them just so like they understand that like there's a need for it, right? Um, plus, hopefully, they hodled and that five dollars okay. or Explain ten dollars. Brief de- detour. What does hodl mean? So we keep saying it, um, and it's just kind of like an internal joke at this point. But uh, there was a Bitcoin talks forum, and some guy like was talking about holding, and in the title he said, "I'm hodling," and he's like, "He's like, I've written it twice. I had the D twice." He's like, "Fuck it, you know what I mean." 
So like, <laughs> right. and like, and everybody's just like, oh, this is gold. And like, I, I screenshot it and I sent it to someone today. And I said like, because I, I was reading through the the forum post, and it was like 2013 when this actually happened, and um, or maybe it was like December 2013 or something. But he goes, somebody goes, this is going to be memed, like, and it has been, like, right, like now it's like everywhere. Yeah. Like everyone, it's it's really funny as like I don't ever say it unless someone's saying it, but um in all the groups you see people saying it and it's i feel like it's like one of those things that people are doing to be cool right it's like when people are like who's my guru you know like it's like oh no one's your guru guy so um but yeah it's just like a little internal like joke about holding holding your bitcoin or holding your crypto right um one specific question here um pete reese why is my buy pending so long well there's uh, a couple questions there. It depends on what exchange you're on, how you're using it, but the buy. So, like, if you're using Coinbase, for instance, uh, if you put in your debit card, the Coinbase uh, transaction is going to go through immediately because you have debit, you have debit and credit card Visa protection on that on that purchase. Essentially, it's limited though. It, yeah, and so you have a limit there, but it'll go through immediately. But if you do what I did, which is you hook up your bank account to it, and you do to an ETF, a draft from your account, ACH. Uh, ACH, I'm sorry. Yeah, ETFs, the exchange traded fund, but yep. an ACH transfer, then it's going to take five days for that to clear. So for me, it was taking uh, in and out of my savings account seven days total with Chase. So your your buy is probably pending so long because you used you hooked up your bank account. So uh, just be aware. So I just transferred out of the Coinbase wallet, the USD wallet, into my savings account, and it took three days. Or no, no, it took five because I did it yesterday on a Wednesday, and I get funds on Tuesday. So uh, just be just be aware of that, just so you know. That's uh, that's why it's taking so long. Shane Lackey on Facebook wants to know, uh, can you get in without your social security number? Definitely. You can get in with as anonymously as you want to or as quickly as you want to. It's it's kind of the trade-off, I think. How and where could I do that should I wanted to move my drug? I mean. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> your drug money, that's the USD. Right. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think you, you mentioned the ATMs, right? Yep. Um, they require hot. some stuff, but I don't know. I, I'm trying to remember what they, you have to set up an account, but I don't know how much they ask for. I don't okay. know if they like took my picture or what, but yeah. So, you know, ATM is one of the more anonymous, yeah. you know, Coinbase, you know, they got your bank account number or your credit card number or whatever. It's, you could, in theory, I think you could, so I was playing around with doing anonymous stuff with USD one time and, um, or trying to buy like certain things that like, I didn't want people to know I had that were, are legal to own. I just didn't want people to know, have recollection that I owned them or any way to track it down. I should say mm -hmm. not recollection, but anyway, um, so net spend is a debit card system that you can go and buy at like your dollar general. Mm. Um, and they charge some heavy fees, but so you might, you, that's the thing with privacy most of the time. And anyone that does private stuff knows that there is a premium to do stuff anonymously right. so um yeah like net spend you could probably i think you could probably hook up a net spend card fund it and then use that on coinbase to buy up to like 100 whatever they set the limit is when you sign up um but if you're going to do that you also probably want to invest in a vpn service which also right. is going to cost you money so which you could buy with bitcoin so if you are interested in vpn service um let me know because i have an affiliate link i could send you um, and maybe Chris will eventually become an affiliate because it seems like it should pertain to libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, um, you can, you can buy it with Bitcoin and I don't know if I actually ended up doing that or not, but, um, definitely if you're going to buy on any kind of exchange, I, I'm not saying I do this, but if you're wanting to be anonymous, use a VPN service and then, uh, get some more. No, I just one of the things I was reading when I was thinking about it is, is oh, well, you can find someone locally. It's basically a person-to-person -person exchange yep. who has Bitcoins that they're willing to sell. You give them U.S. dollars. They give you a code, yep. and you anonymously own some Bitcoin. Yep. Of course, there's inherent risk of meeting a stranger on the street and giving them right. cash money for Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> but it's if you want to be anonymous... 
and stay offline. That's the probably. That's the most anonymous way to do it. Most anonymous, yet, yet creepiest, maybe. I don't know. There's a, a website called localbitcoins.com. I don't know if that helps you pair up to do people. I've never used it. Um, but I know, like, people in all the crypto groups and Facebook that I'm in will, you know, pimp that uh, website up. So I don't know if, like, you can, like, meet up with local people because that would actually be kind of cool. And there, I know there's a review system in it, um, which is okay. Um, so that you, you have someone, I don't want to say they're arbiting, but at least there's some sort of like review system going in. So, you know, you're not like meeting Joe Frank. who's just going to like beat you down for a hundred bucks. Um, but I would also say, argue you should probably look on meetup. So the first time I ever went to a, bit, a Bitcoin meetup, there, there was no group. There still isn't. That's why I created, uh, the Indiana or in our crypto group, or not in our crypto, Indiana crypto group, um, was just to kind of bring the Indiana people together. So we have a place to chat, but, um, I sent you that guy's name, but he ran the first, the only reason I knew of him, I think was because of Maya and uh, the vape shop in Irvington. And he operated like one of the first Bitcoin ATMs in Indiana. Right. So, um, but anyway, he, he leads a, um, uh, a meetup on, or yeah, a meetup that funnels through meetup.com. And I went to that and met some couple people that way. And that's how I initially ended up with my last time I ever owned Bitcoin. Uh, somebody wanted like $200 worth. I was like, oh, not a problem. I got Coinbase. I'll just buy it. And on, you know, you can swap it out, whatnot. And I bought it and I was like, where, where the hell is it? <laughs> and I only had a maximum daily draw of a hundred bucks. And I was like, look, dude, I'm not going to get this till Friday. Hmm. So I was in the same situation. So I was like, I gave him his $200 back. I'm like, Hey man, am I bad? And then the Bitcoin jumped up to 600 bucks. So I like, I made 400 bucks off the deal or whatnot. And then, uh, I think I, I took that back out what I put in and then took the other money and I think I took 400 out and then used the 200 to like get into dash or whatever. So, uh, Ron Holland asks, what are the best anonymous wallets to get into? I mean, uh, uh, what are the best anonymous ways to get into Bitcoin? So, yeah, I don't, that question was confusing to me. Um, cause I don't know what you mean, what it was meant by anonymous wallets. If he was talking about anonymous crypto, like the currency itself, um, Dash is pretty anonymous. Um, there's Zcash, which some people like. I've tried to buy it, and that's how I actually lost some crypto one time doing uh, doing some shape shifting. Shapeshift.io is a, a what? Shapeshift. Are you a fucking globalist? <laughs> Did I let a globalist on my program? Are you one of those alien shape shifting globalists? Are I'm, you a lizard? It's uh, it's like a. It's kind of a cool exchange where it allows you to put some coins in of some whatever type of coin, and then they will give you an exchange for another coin. Okay. Um, I, I forget who created it. But I think it was one of the one of the first Bitcoin guys. But um, anyway, I I apparently put my I wanted some Zcash, so I think I had like Dash or Bitcoin, and I wanted to get some Zcash. And when I put my address in, I never got it. So I don't know what the hell happened to it, but I lost money. Um, so anyway, Zcash. Uh, one of the more popular ones that you'll see in some of the groups uh, is Monero. Monero is pretty promising when it comes to anonymity, but the, my biggest problems with it is it's it's not as slow as Bitcoin, but it's pretty damn slow. And Monero has also got pretty high transaction fees right now as well. So um, you can get Monero. I think Monero is going to have a lot of growth mm -hmm. because it's talked about everywhere, and I can't seem to get people to buy into Pivx because they have Monero, um, but that is another one. So, And then my recommendation, and, and that's what I have right now, is Pivx. Uh, Pivx is a, like I said, it's a fork of Dash. Um, like I talked about the master nodes earlier, you can become a master node operator. It also works off proof of stake versus proof of work, which we haven't talked about yet, um, but essentially there are no miners for Pivx. They get minted, hmm. um, and there's inflation built in, but the act of creating anonymous coins burns them off of the chain. So that's a very complicated thing, but um, essentially you can send, you can mint Z Pivx. I don't have the emotional strength to go through another explanation of any of this shit. I know, right? So. <laughs> like, when you're like uh, minting and then it burns off the inflation, I'm like, you are just making things up, I, sir. What, what when, you, I, when I read it, I'm just saying, like, I know from, a, from like, a white, like, not even their white paper, but, like, their sales pitch they have on their website where they talk about this stuff. Um, uh -huh. But anyway, like, that was what I thought was cool. So proof of stake versus proof of work, there are no miners. Uh, Ethereum moved to proof of stake. 
Um, but Pivx has always been proof of stake. And what that means is without miners, you don't have power being used to generate these things. So I see that as a benefit um, because if some authoritative entity wants to shut it down, they, it's going to be really hard to know who has it. Mm. Um, so what they do is you can stake. So you buy into it, right? And then the amount you own, you put up, you stake it. Gotcha. So you're, you're putting it up. You're saying, hey, look, I'm going to keep this note online, and I'm going to own this much. I've got this much to put on a plate. Okay. And whoever puts all of their savings onto it, they also have master notes. That's the one you need 10,000 of is, is PIVX. Right. Uh, but anyway, if you own one PIV or one PIVX, you could buy, download a wallet for your, you know, your machine, your desktop or whatnot, put it in staking, and you would eventually make money for keeping that note online. So hmm. everyone who owns it and puts their wallet in staking gets rewarded for keeping a note online. Okay. And, and do you have uh, – Harry said you have to have a special proce processor or something to keep that online? like For PIVX? No. Okay. For Bitcoin, I guess so you For do. mining. For mining, you need yeah. – so ma mining used to be able to be done with like graphics cards, and you can do ASIC miners now. Okay. So I guess this is probably a more simple question that I should have asked an hour ago, but – like you have the coins themselves you have the the are the coins the same as the exchanges so like is there the bitcoin exchange and the dash exchange kind of like the new york stock exchange i mean what is the difference between a coin and exchange and a wallet yeah think about that for a second just because like i know with gda gdax G which is, is what i call it yeah. G, gdax is something that uh was highly recommended by several people in uh in their in the uh group chat and it's an exchange and you can you know that's what coinbase trades off of on that exchange but i guess it's like you can have the new york stock exchange and you can have nasdaq and those are two different exchanges and you can have the same stock on no, I don't think you can. I think you no, have to have, different. like, no. if you want to, you have to choose NYSE or you have to choose NASDAQ to trade on. I think you're, well, I think your trading account, you could probably purchase from either one. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you go mm -hmm. into, like, uh, I don't even know what, a, a broking stuff. I, I used it, to well, trade exchange is like a but... brokerage. That's, I mean, that's where we're getting at, right? It's not the stock, New York Stock Exchange versus NASDAQ. It's a brokerage house. Uh, right, I'm but there are but there are exchanges. Yeah, I'm in, trying to I'm trying to think like the best way to think about it. I mean, an exchange is just like a marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and that's all it is. Is like, I've got this microphone, and you've got that microphone, and I'm like, I want fourteen fifty for my microphone, and someone's like, hell no, fourteen thirty nine, and like I buy that one, and then that that if that keeps happening, that's what creates the thing. You know, that's what drives the market down. But if if you're asking and you're like, no, I want fourteen fifty, you're like, I want fourteen fifty one. Then like, if someone buys, right, whatever they end up buying, that's what kind of pushes that up. So, and then when people are buying it at that price, that's where like you get you see the market cap growing, or the sorry, the volume is what I meant to say. Um, and you can see this. So there's a definitely a couple like we didn't talk about this and this wasn't asked, but if you get on to Netflix, there is one or two really one of them's decent, and there's a, like a really good Bitcoin documentary on there. Um, I think there's one on Amazon's delivery system, mm -hmm. whatever they call it. I forget. Just part of Prime, I guess. Um, and there's some on YouTube. And one of them, I, there's a an exchange. I don't know if it's still there or not, but in New York, I think, where, like, you could go and just buy. And, like, there's people, like, calling out. And mm -hmm. they're like, I want to buy Bitcoin at this number. And, like, they could be like, I'm, I got it. I'm buying it. And then, like, you'll go and, like, trade in person. Wow your Bitcoin across and stuff. So it's just, it's just a marketplace okay, for, for an exchange. And then a wallet is where you store the coins you purchase. Right. Um, those are protected um, by A, yourself, but B, um, you have, again, these hashes, and you have a public and a private key. Uh, your public key is what you would give to people, and your private key is, like, what gets you grants you access to your wallet. So. Right. So Brent was asking, asked that question, are certain wallets only compatible with certain exchanges, or are the two wallets and exchanges completely independent of each other? Every exchange will have a wallet, but not that they're going to put your your coins in, okay. and then you would withdraw from the exchange into whatever other wallet you have. So they're 
So it's kind of like your LimeWire username is your wallet, but it doesn't matter what, you know, what what network you're entering. It can kind of it can interact with those with that unique ID within your wallet. Mm, I wouldn't say that. Okay. All right. Strike that for the record. <laughs> and that was uh, completely stupid. I apologize to the listeners. I'm an idiot. That's why we're here. Uh, again, this is it gets complicated and it's hard to like boil down sometimes. So. So, so the way I understand it is some wallets, quote unquote, can hold multiple types of cryptos right. and some wallets are for only the specific kind, be it Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or whatever. Right. So you can't you, you might end up needing to have multiple wallets based on what types of crypto you're buying or how you buy them. You might have multiple wallets for one crypto. Right. Just and you got to keep track of them all. Right. And that, okay. Yeah. So I was going to say, like, you're talking about, you know, um, well, I don't want to say you're talking about this, but, um, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever said it, but with freedom comes great responsibility. And that's kind of like how this is, right? Like, mm-hmm. You have to, like, own your shit. And that's kind of like part of what freedom is and why we can't just turn switches off. Yeah, I mean, you pay. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like with, you know, Chase. I pay them twelve bucks a month or whatever in one of my accounts, right? For all the services they give me, right? You know, administrative work, right? Which so. is stupid because they're you know they don't need my twelve dollars a month, they, right? They get uh, they get plenty of government money, it's passive and, income. And, they have to do it anyways, right? Uh, okay, but what, I was gonna I, go ahead. Did that help? Did that clear up the, mur- the murkiness there, or do so, I, I think it's just there, it is what it is. You got to have, if, you know, if I want to do, uh, if if I want to do Dash, then I need to fund out of my bank account into Uphold, and then if I want to do, you know, we can go I, through Bitrix for Dash too, but yeah, right. So or whatever. So Chris Chris Osborne asks, what's the safest and easiest way to buy a small amount? I'm worried about lo- losing money to hackers and or swindlers. Like to my mind, like. I'm really pleased with the Coinbase experience, and I felt that it was very safe. I felt like it, it's very well known. Like, I have had zero issues with Coinbase. And I think if you're just going to kind of dip your toe into the water, I would start with Coinbase. Like, just start there and see what you, see what it's like and then look around. And while you're playing with it a little bit, because, you know, if, if you're impulsive like me and you're like, oh, I'm going to put $150 into this this week and see what I get. And, oh, I got 300. Cool. I'm going to pull it all out, you know. And so it's 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 been like a nice little thing for me to just kind of look at because I was I didn't want to lose one hundred and fifty dollars, but it was money that I had that I could, you know, that was my savings for the month that I could kind of play with. Right. Right. So you you have the ability to kind of easily play with a, a, a little bit and get your get your feet wet because once you start getting into the other stuff like I needed to understand the concept of how this stuff moves and what the market is like and uh, the, all the the ups and downs of it and coinbase has been very uh, it's a very pretty app it's easy to look at it's easy to move money in and out of your bank account the mobile like, app works well too it's mm-hmm. and that's what I'm using is the mobile app and like and it's just easy. And it kind of gives you a little view into it. And then if you want to go hardcore more into like GDAX or Dashcoin or Ripple or whatever, you're going to have a little better understanding than just diving right into something where you've got to download Airbits. And like I downloaded Airbits the day I downloaded Coinbase and I looked at Airbits and I went, I don't get this. No, thank you. And I was like, Coinbase is easy. So now I could tackle that because two weeks later I'm sitting here going, Okay, I get the basic concept of how this works because of Coinbase. So, uh, I, I it, it seems secure. You know, it's it's. I I don't know if it's secure or not. Just as much as like, even if I were uh, a security expert like Harry, <laughs> when Harry tells me and several other people tell me that Coinbase is trustworthy, I go, okay, these are people I trust. Right. You know. As opposed to just kind of looking with your eyes and going, oh, this looks real sketchy. Yeah. You know, where some of these exchanges look sketchy. Yeah, so they look right. awful. So, yeah. I, I don't know what if you guys agree with that or not, but that that's my advice is as a new person who's a couple weeks, a <laughs> month or so into it more than you are, 
I liked I liked the Coinbase experience. I thought it was helpful. No, I, I really enjoy the Coinbase experience. I think going into it, like I said, if you're going to jump into something, I would buy not because I'm saying it's going to be worth anything, but just because of transaction fees and everything, I would go with like Ethereum or Litecoin uh, over Bitcoin because Bitcoin, like I said, their transaction fees have been outrageous. Yeah, I would um, agree. So, uh, if, especially again, if you want to play, because that way any gains you get, you're not going to get eaten in fees. Uh, for that very nice experience that Coinbase provides, they do charge a fee for it. So um, that's why, you know, GDAX and all these other, like Bitrix and stuff, they look more like your trading app. If you're ever, tra- if you've ever traded stocks, you do ask pricing, you do bid pricing, you can set sells, you can set buys. It, it's very complicated if you don't understand the interface of standard trading applications. So now if you're just buying in, just trying it out, getting your yep. feet wet, Bit- Coinbase, uh, I, I think uh, we all agree. Coinbase. Now, and like you said, you know, Bitcoin fees. So, so I put a hundred bucks in a few weeks ago. Right. By the time I paid Coinbase fees and then moved to a different wallet off the exchange, I was down 10%. Right. Right. Mm. Now, of course, I'm up significantly since then, right. but it's just something to be aware of. Like you said, if you go Ethereum or Litecoin or something else. Harry is saying CryptoCompare.com. Yep. So, which, uh, yeah, I well, just, I only paid a dollar per transaction on, on Coinbase. For I mean, Litecoin? For, for Litecoin, for Bitcoin, for everything. Oh, uh, but that's because you did ACH. Oh, okay. Yeah. So ACH is cheaper for them to do. Okay. Um, they charge four ninety nine for a transaction with debit card. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the more you buy, the bigger. I think. Um, I I placed an order for Litecoin the other day, um, for someone, and it was like eleven ninety nine in fees. Ooh. Okay. So you do have to pay attention to that. Yeah. Everything was a dollar for me, and then, yeah, like trading, you know, putting it into my USD wallet and then putting it into the Litecoin at one point. I took out of Bitcoin into the wallet, put it into Litecoin, and that was a dollar out and a so dollar in. Either one of you can probably answer this then. and Because this is new since I've been to Coinbase. Coinbase used to not. Um, maybe they did, but I just don't remember. I don't recall them having a USD wallet, but now they do. So can you upload from ACH? I'm sorry, can you create an ACH transaction into your USD wallet? And that way, like, you're not actually jumping in to either any of them like you're not like hey i want to buy litecoin at this number like you can just say i just want to fund my account because this is how trading works right like you set Mm -hmm. up an ach transfer and usually there's like a thousand dollar minimum or something but um you can create an ach transfer can you just do ach into your coinbase to the usd wallet yeah absolutely so yeah okay cool yeah there's uh so if i want to fund my usd wallet and i want to deposit money not not from yeah, right. deposit create an ACH transfer from your bank right. savings to the Coinbase USD wallet. I is that or not hit deposit because that'll do it. <laughs> but yeah, you can do that, and I don't know if there's, I don't think there's a, f- a fee for it. But if you if you're going from, you know, there's a limit. So if I want to go into Litecoin and I want to buy, I've got a ten thousand dollar weekly limit, the bank limits for my savings account. Jeez, bro, ten thousand. Flexing. Uh, yeah, but I mean, obviously, let's, let's do it. I'm never gonna hit the, like. <laughs> well, I've, fuck it, I've, let's do it. I've never. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of money for you, me. You wouldn't be sleeping for weeks. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh! I would immediately be calling. Uh, You'd be really either really rich or really poor. Oh, both. Uh, all right, so we need to start wrapping up. So, bottom line, somebody out there wants to get involved in cryptocurrency. What are the cryptocurrencies that you would suggest and recommend, and how would they do it? We'll start with him, uh, Jeff. <laughs> I, I don't know if that I can answer this. I mean, we said Coinbase. That's, that's first it, of, right? First of all, we are not financial experts. We, <laughs> yes, are, we, we are just disclaimer. dudes yeah. sitting around a table. <laughs> we are not telling you to do anything. And, you know, obviously we all have money. I have at least $2.80. So whatever financial legal bullshit I have to say, <laughs> exactly. I want you to know that I'm saying financial advice is is not well, uh, what we're good at, but right. we're just dudes who have done it. Uh, <laughs> so for me, I recommend Coinbase because that's all I've, I've played with. Right. And I think if you're at the very bottom, Coinbase was, was good, and I think Bitcoin, Litecoin, those two are going to go up. Ethereum seemed you know, pretty stable. Like right now, they've been at 16 for about a week. So you're you're you know even when everybody thought that once 
there was an ETF fund and hedge funds were allowed to invest last Monday. Like it didn't really change much. I mean, it's just fluctuated between 16 and 18 for a week. So I, I just don't think that you're, I, I would get in and I would just say, all right, put in a hundred bucks and just keep it in there and just forget about it. Yeah. You know, well, and, don't completely forget about it. Or you'll never get it back. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Like put, <laughs> if you've got 300 bucks, put it in each of the three, but right. I, I'm not the, the expert necessarily, but well, I'd say the same thing. Coinbase, you know, I think you, you fully believe Bitcoin is in a bubble right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it is in a bubble, but I think the bubble is still inflating. Yeah, so, which is very possible. You know, I, as far as is it going to continue to go up? Is it going to hit 20,000? Who knows, right? Think of it as just a fun experiment. Yeah, like it, I, that's why I say like if you put a hundred in each one of these three, and if let's say you've got five hundred bucks laying around after Christmas, put a hundred into to those three plus Ripple and Dash, and just leave them, and then see what happens in six months. Right, and it could be up to eighty thousand, and then you're rich. But if you lost five hundred bucks that you got for Christmas anyways, so be it. I mean, if you need the five hundred dollars, if you're young stone Aldridge out there who has twenty, he's twenty one and is eating mcdoubles to survive then don't do that but yeah. you know if you're most of our listeners can afford you know a 100 bucks per coin yeah, and then once you get once you get familiar with the way the exchanges work the way the fee systems work and and whatnot do some more research on your own then start maybe going into what you're going to talk about next <laughs> yeah i mean um so i would i'm going to say a couple things one i I'm not going to say like you should invest in these. These are the ones I find interesting. I don't necessarily put money on coins that could get growth. Like Rob every day tells me I should buy Litecoin and I tell him the fuck off. Cause I don't, <laughs> I don't think it provides anything that Bitcoin already does. Right. So to me, there's no technology advancement that they're providing. So, uh, but I agree if you're going to get started, uh, use Coinbase to get in, um, get your feet wet. Um, and the reason there's two reasons for that. You could also choose Gemini, which is another place that you can get uh, USD to Bitcoin or whatever. Um, so, and then it's also there's a, that's the one Gemini is owned by the the Winklevoss twins. So okay. it's also a highly protected. I don't want to say protected, but highly. Which, which one was this? Gemini. Okay. You, it's a USD to BTC. So those are the ones you need because those are your entry to any other exchange, anyways. Because most exchanges don't use USD. Mm. Most exchanges trade on BTC, like Bitcoin. Okay. So, which sucks because Bitcoin's fees, but um, there's a, there's been conversation around some Litecoin exchanges have opening up to where okay. you can trade Litecoin for other crypto. But anyway, I don't want to confuse people. So, Coinbase, uh, USD, Gemini, you can also do USD to buy Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, and Ethereum. If you're going to purchase, I would do something like Litecoin or Ethereum because of their fees being lower. You don't want to get burned in fees. Um, you also, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So the other thing is don't treat this like you're going to get rich. Treat this like you're gambling on penny slots. Like you're going to lose any money that you put into that <laughs> right. account. Yeah. Don't, if you have gambling addictions, please don't do this. Yeah. This is not good for you. <laughs> um, if you don't, and you're just like, I want to throw a couple hundred bucks at it. Do it. See what happens. Like you said, in six months, jump into some other uh, some other coins. Like I said, in order to get into Ripple and Dash, unless the rumor that's been spreading today and yesterday is true, um, there was a rumor going around that Coinbase might open up to Ripple, Ooh. Dash, and uh, Monero, and maybe IOTA. I don't know. But um, I don't know. That That's a super speculative rumor, but... Uh, it would be nice for Dash, and I wish I would have owned it still because it, then it's going to explode, I think. But um, if you do want to migrate from these core, these core coins, I, I use Bittrex. Um, a lot of people also use Binance. And you will trade your Bitcoin for whatever it's worth. For You will do an exchange to what other crypto you want. The crypto that I am really like ecstatic about right now well there's two but monero is one it's like trading at like 300 dollars a coin 
and then Pivx, which is trading at five dollars, and I've already lost another like four hundred dollars since we've been sitting here, and I talked about it last. How much money do you have in this thing? <laughs> Jeez. So, uh, so also gambling problem that he knows that Jeff exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, I just look at it all the time. So, uh, but he's anyway, an early adopter though, so he's he's right. built up from back when you know. Bitcoin was three. I've only ever put like three or four hundred dollars into this. He's he's like me in the annoying comments on the big Facebook page. <laughs> I go and look at the Wheeler Libertarian's Facebook. Like motherfucker, <laughs> like ah, I bet I'm not gonna look at that. Five minutes later, oh motherfucker, <laughs> I'm making comments. <laughs> no, I'm just like, you're addicted to looking at your. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, if you're going to do that, I I like Pivx a lot for multiple reasons, and the reason that. Outside of it being a Dash clone, because I was a huge Dash proponent, I still think Dash is better than most coins um, because it's fast. Um, is the the ability that everyone who's contributing is getting incentivized to do so. Mm. Um, that way, nodes stay online. That keeps the network safer. Um, you will be, when you stake, you receive Pivx for your reward. So you it's kind of like a savings account at that point. Um, and eventually, if you got enough Pivx, you could become a master node and get voting rights uh, within the Pivx organization. So that is my big thing. It's also like 66, 60 second confirmation times. It's super fast. It's super secure. They've rolled out wallets, which Monero does not have right now. So like I can download a Pivx wallet on my phone and I can put Pivx on my phone. Um, it's supported by Ledger um, and they are working. The, the team behind it seems to be really good. Uh, as far as um, trying to work with the exchanges and get on more exchanges. Mm -hmm. They also um, were the first proof of stake coin to implement zero, the zero coin, the zero protocol. Okay. So where it's literally a completely anonymous transaction. So hmm. they're to me, they're doing a lot of dev work and doing a lot of stuff to make crypto as close to cash as possible. So cool. So, this has been percolating around in my head as we've been talking here. What, so what I think at the end of the day, when we're looking at alternatives to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. what what's going to be the Bitcoin killer at the end of the day? Right? That was one of our questions too. What what's going to say Bitcoin? Yeah, it's worth three dollars and not eleven thousand dollars, or seventeen thousand, or whatever it is today. What are the key components of this? Is what's going to be the game changer at the end of the day? Um, speed, it has to transfer fast, right? Otherwise commerce will never do it. Um, and by speed, you have, you have different speeds that get measured. Uh, the first is the transactions, which are damn near instantaneous. And then you have confirmation. And I believe dash or sorry, Pivx can get you three confirmations in less than a minute. Dash is 120 seconds. So mm. two minutes. Um, that to me, the if you use like the private ones, like the ZPIV, it's going to be slower just because it, of the way right. that things work. But um, if you don't give a shit, if you're at CVS buying Tylenol, like it, you just use whatever, you know, you don't care if somebody can see it. Um, it will be, it's very, very, very quick. Um, there's other ones that are quick too. It's just, it has a lot of stuff. I was already partial to Dash and then I was like, oh, like this is like a Dash fork that is even per, like extending on what dash was doing right so that was my biggest thing um a lot of people don't like that it's proof of stake but that's the other thing that i think is going to be important is that countries are where you know bitcoin is using the amount of countries or the amount of power that like nigeria does or some shit but it's going to i look at it as like marijuana growing um and the authoritative peoples you're that, talking about actual energy power plants yeah yeah yeah. i'm saying like bitcoin to power these computers takes the the energy required to power like nigeria, nigeria which is 250 million people yeah, in africa which, uh, they may or may not all have power like that. <laughs> <laughs> that seems mildly racist but probably accurate no as i'm saying i mean like that's what so that that's the thing we never talked to you is like what crypto does for third world countries but um which is very important and i we might have shown us or something that i can add but there's a couple podcasts if you're really interested in this that i would also recommend that 
aren't necessarily libertarian based, but are interviews with people who are really close to the crypto scene and can really elaborate on a lot of things on what what are the, the names? Future. What are they? Uh, so there's an interview um, by Tim Ferriss with um, Nick Sabo. Mm-hmm. So just Google like Tim Ferriss, Nick Sabo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sabo is S Z A B O, I believe. Okay. Um, he and does if- a good job. Like Nick is like one of the first, or not one of the first, but one of the original like um, cypherpunks mm-hmm. that kind of like was into like this crypto stuff a long time ago, or crypto punks. I don't know whatever they call them, but um, and he actually created a uh, like a digital currency before and but he didn't have he, i don't know if it was the double spin problem but like there was a problem they ran into so anyway tim has an interview with nick it's really good nick does not do a lot of interviews um tim's prod- podcasts are typically three hours long so um, this audience will love them yeah yeah i mean and, you know two to two to three hours long uh he kind of talks about what a miner does um and he, he associates it to like uh, putting the amber on, like, I don't know, the mosquito or something from Jurassic Park. There's something to do with amber, I remember, but uh, laying amber down. Um, and then Kevin Rose, who is friends with Tim, and but Kevin Rose is from uh, Started, screensavers and stuff back in the day. With didn't Laporte. he start Dig? Was he? Was yeah, it? so he yeah. Uh, he left Tech TV and stuff and started Dig. Right. But anyway, Kevin has his own podcast as well. And uh, he interviews... I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher the name. It's like Andreas Ananopoulos or something, but he's like one of the one of the core Bitcoin Bitcoin guys as well, uh, and does a ton of talks. Okay. So, um, and like I said, I can give you the links to those. If, I don't know, yeah, do send, show notes. Yeah, I'll, I'll link them. I'll put them in there. Cool. So yeah, so I, send me whatever links that you, and Harry, if you're watching, send those links to me, and then I'll I'll put them in the show notes for people. Yeah, like, those. I mean, like those have been some of the the best podcasts I've seen. I highly recommend the Bitcoin documentaries just a, to get a history about it, to kind of see how things work. There's a Bitcoin documentary where a guy tries to live on Bitcoin for a week, mm. um, which uh, I think it's the same dude that does. It's the same dude that did a uh, palm and all that stuff. Okay. He just came out and said that he likes women to I don't oh, know. Spurlock. Yeah. Spurlock. Morgan Spurlock. I think yeah. Morgan Spurlock does it. I think it's Morgan Spurlock that does the live on Bitcoin for a week thing. Okay. Um, He's kind of a douche to be honest with you. Yeah. But it was kind of cool, like to see him try to do something. So yeah, right. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know where I was going with all this, but all right. Well, that's that's good enough. Uh, so I think we kind of we kind of gave people a good overview, um, and then we've we've given them a good introduction. And then if you want to check it out, uh, sorry for whistling through my teeth there. <laughs> um, and like I said, if you have further questions or more recommendations, hop into our Facebook group at wearelibertarians.com, and then the link is right there. Um, I, let's do final thoughts. So you, you, you boys may not know this, but at the end, we give everybody a chance to just give final thoughts for the episode. Shameless self-promotion if you want. Whatever you want to say, it's your chance. Jesse, you're returning, so I'll let you do it first, okay. and then we'll go to Jeff. Final, um... final thoughts. Final thoughts. Really pay attention to blockchain technology because it is going to change the world. It already has. Um, and you can find me uh, on Facebook at Jesse the Libertarian, I believe, on Facebook. And I think just at Jesse Riddle on Twitter. Okay. Jeff? Hey, I just want to say thanks for having me on the show. Uh, first first time here. So i um, glad to be sitting next to these guys. And uh, same thing. Uh, I think blockchain and crypto at some point is going to be the next big thing in a way that we don't even understand yet. So it's one of those things that will be important. Just pay attention, like you said, and um, that's about it. So maybe you'll hear me again on the show some other time on another topic. Yeah, I'd love love to have you back. So, yeah, the Google World Food Bank and blockchain, and you'll find an article, I think it was Foreign Policy or foreign affairs or somebody wrote an article recently about how blockchain technology is changing food uh, world food relief uh blockchain is being put into a lot used to change a lot of different a- aspects of society i mean and not and, and in positive ways because it's pro liberty you know like the micro loans for instance uh there's towns in india that are you know called kidney towns where basically people sell their kidneys in these Indian towns because they got a micro loan, which was started by Barack Obama's mother, which was supposed to change the third world by 
These little microloans of $1,000 will change the lives of third world peasants to start businesses and industries like the like during the Industrial Revolution. But the problem is they uh, never got the businesses off the ground but still had to pay back the $1,000, which to use me like $100,000, so they sold their kidneys. They sold their kids' kidneys. So, you know, blockchain is pro-growth. It's pro-liberty as opposed to a loan where you're owing a bank. Uh, and so in my mind, this is something that is really exciting, and I'm excited to kind of learn a lot about it, and uh, hopefully you are too, and we will continue to talk about this in future episodes. Not every episode, not a, not a Bitcoin show, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into this a little bit and see what what's out there. Um, all right, thank you for joining us on this episode of We're Libertarians. Uh, as I mentioned at the end, uh, this is my last show for the year. I will be taking some time off at the end of uh, – uh, I today is December 14th, and starting tomorrow, I get the rest of the month off from work. And so what I always do is shut down for half a month, and uh, I just lay around the house and enjoy the holidays with my family, and I try not to follow too much news and get all worked up and – uh, don't don't do much. I hibernate. I'm gonna clean the place a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so I will be taking the rest of the month off, so you can get caught up on all the shows. Harry may co-host, uh, may guest host a couple shows. Uh, I will be doing one show though, and I want you to tune into this because I think it's a really cool idea. So what I'm going to be doing is uh, taking two candidates. They're going to square off in in a in a entrepreneurial type showdown uh where you'll will have two experts judging the answers of the two candidates uh so i want to know questions that you would want to ask a candidate uh just generic questions about the strength of a campaign what would it take for you to support a candidate these are are candidates that that range from nonpartisan offices republicans democrats libertarian party people green party people um, I don't know about green, but anybody who's libertarian, uh, what I'm saying is I want nonpartisan. I'm not not going to be partisan about this, but I want I want to kind of create a new model for uh, giving candidates a chance to pitch themselves to the this audience, which is one of the biggest audiences in the libertarian movement, and help them get exposure and donations in an interesting way that you want to listen to. So we're going to do a test episode on January 29th or on uh, December 29th, and uh, I hope you tune into that and check that out. We're going to work out some of the kinks, so that's not going to be the final. What I'm thinking about is maybe like a membership club, so you pitch in 10 bucks a month, and you get to be a voting member of the group, or you get to ask questions or something. So just trying to work through this idea, so I want to kind of crowdsource this idea, because we've got this big platform, and candidates need exposure from the liberty movement to the libertarian uh, movement, and I want to be a part of that moving forward. So check that out. I think that's going to be kind of a cool idea that I'm working through with a couple people. So check that out. Um, yeah, it has been a great year. Uh, this has been, A, the best year of my life. This has been the best year of the podcast, in my opinion. Very transitional year for the podcast. A lot of changes. Um, a lot of different experiments, but I really feel uh, good about where we're at as a podcast, as a community, as a movement, and I thank you for being part of it. I thank all the Patreon folks who are a part of it, uh, Brandon Luke, Christy Avery, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, my $100 a month subscribers, uh, first and foremost. Um, yeah, a lot of growth in the podcast. A thousand new people every single month added to the podcast uh, since the end of the 2016 elections. We're heading into another election year where it should be another wild and crazy ride every single day. And we're going to continue to help make you sound smarter when you talk with your friends in 2018. I hope that you will join us, that you will continue to promote this podcast, that you will join our communities and get to know some of the uh, other listeners. Uh, so... Enjoy the holidays with your family. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. Uh, Hakuna Matata. Yule. Uh, enjoy your Yule logs. And please don't eat the random chocolates in the Fannie Mae box because you may end up with toothpaste <laughs> when you think it's a cherry co chocolate covered cherry. Was like I did the other day. I was mm. hoping it was a chocolate covered cherry, one of my favorite candies, and I ended up with toothpaste. 
So until 2018, we say be good to each other.